grows, uh, as the opposition does. So um, I want to introduce um, our panel. We'll get right to it. Um, on my left is Ed Black, who is the president and CEO of the Computer and Communications Industry Association, known as CCIA. Uh, next to him, Gigi Sohn, president and co-founder of Public Knowledge. Then we have Steve DeMora, my name with the DE, uh, the president of Americans for Job Security. And then we'll hand it over to David Segal, who is the executive director of Demand Pro Progress. David Moon. David Moon, I thought you were David Segal. Two Davids, sorry. David Moon. Uh, and then Patrick Ruffini, who is the executive director of Don't Censor the Net. And um, the ex officio. Well, you're, okay, the ex officio members of our panel today. And then uh, Michael Petricone of uh, the Consumer Electronics Association, uh, if he would like to join in ex officio status as well. So. Um, each panelist will have about two minutes. Uh, we know we've got a big dais up here. Two to three minutes, and then we'll open it up to your questions. So, Mr. Black. Uh, yeah, if we limit our, agree to limit our, our topical focus, there's, there are a lot of things about this bill I'd love to talk about. But let me focus a little bit on um, the core issue, which is there is a problem that Congress is trying to solve about rogue websites. This legislation does not solve that problem, but it does create a lot of problems for the rest of the Internet industry. And it is that industry that I think we need to understand how significant and important it is because it is affected in a, in a serious way. Um, one of the key elements of the industry that has allowed it to flourish is that it is the messenger and we believe in the concept of don't kill the messenger. That's what DMCA was all about, that's what Section 230 has been about. Uh, it is vital, it is what is a premise that has allowed internet companies to grow uh, to flourish and be a huge part of our economy. They are, in fact, a $2 trillion part of the economy. Uh, CCA conducted, a, authored an uh, uh, economic study on about fair use in the U.S. economy, which showed that fair use is a $3.4 trillion component of the economy. 21% of the GDP growth in mature econ economies over the past five years has come out of the Internet sector. Two billion people around the world are connected to the internet. That's probably number, it's probably changed because it's, it's got to be a week old. Um, Eight trillion in exchange, dollars exchange in terms of commerce over the internet. This is an industry and this internet is not just about industry. It is the most transforming development in our lifetimes. Its impact on the world in terms of knowledge, information flow, culture, empowerment, politics, and the relationship between citizens and government is tremendous. We're asking that Congress be very careful not to kill the goose that lays the golden egg here. Uh, this is, it is unique. The internet industry has flourished in the United States. It has done so, we believe, because we have a very important, careful balance of various stakeholders and how they have, their rights and responsibilities have been apportioned. It is that fundamental foundation which we believe is being uh, disrupted by the legislative proposals before us. When you think about the amount of the volume and activity that takes place, and we'll go into a lot of specifics of what the legislation does in terms of the way in which it imposes burden on our industry, but we have 50 million tweets a, a day. When you think of what is required to, in fact, guarantee, which in essence the legislation says, you must uh, guarantee that what you link to, how, your, how sites operate. I'm not using the legal language of the, of the bill here, but the pragmatic way companies will look at this <coughs> legislation is that they will be responsible and must set up mechanisms, in essence, to guarantee that no infringement activity can take place uh, in their website by their company. It is a huge burden. Uh, the specific language we can, we can break out and do a legal analysis for, uh, for you. Uh, it'll be in the testimony that's being submitted tomorrow. Um, but the outcome is it's a tremendous burden and collateral damage on the in very important internet industry. Hi, I'm Gigi Stone with Public Knowledge. And I want to thank Representatives Issa and Lofgren. Like Representative Lofgren, I'm delighted to be on the same side as Re Representative Issa. 
He has taken me uh, around and round and round in several hearings, so it's really great <laughs> to be on the same page. I want to just, I want to raise three and a half or four points, uh, objections that my organization, Public Knowledge, has about SOPA, which is the Stop Online Piracy Act, that is going to be the subject of the hearing tomorrow for the House Judiciary Committee. It's not our only objection, but I only have three minutes, so uh, I, I could take all day, but I won't. The first Representative Lofkin raised, and, and, and that is that this bill undermines the delicate balance of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Now, the way the DMCA is supposed to work is that a copyright holder sees that their content is being infringed on a website or, you know, on a network, on any, you know, internet intermediaries network, and that copyright holder tells the intermediary to take it down, and there's a process for figuring out whether that, that content is indeed infringing or not. Well, SOPA turns that on its head, and instead, it requires intermediaries to be the copyright police and figure out, and it's not so easy to figure out what's infringing or not. Sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it's really difficult. And if they don't do so, they can be sued under the very vaguest of, circumstance, of standards. You may have heard uh, that Warner Brothers just admitted that it just sort of willy-nilly uh, asked for takedowns of, of content it believed to be infringing on hotfile.com, and, and now has admitted that it just didn't really look at those files very carefully, but it just, it just abused the process. And there are many, many, many anecdotes, but there are many, uh, about copyright holders just willy-nilly sending takedown notices, and this process could be abused as well. <coughs> Second, the bill could be used to violate the FCC's new net network neutrality rules. It, it allows a network provider an excuse to say, well, I thought this content was infringing and I had a reasonable belief, well, belief that it was infringing. And if, and if the content is not infringing, a party could not bring a suit either in a state or federal court or a complaint at the FCC. They have immunity from such a complaint. So, you know, this is where the Comcast BitTorrent situation comes up. Comcast could have said, if, this, if SOPA was in place then, well, we just knew that we just had a reasonable belief that there was infringing material, so we just took it down, which they would survive under that standard, the reasonable belief standard. In fact, they were probably right that there was infringing material on that, but they really took down BitTorrent for any competitive uh, and other reasons. So that concerns us. Finally, and I think this is critically important, the bill will hurt America's standing as a defender of free speech and global internet freedom. Now, we've heard Secretary of State Clinton talk about the importance of global internet freedom. We have chided China and Russia and Middle East countries for cutting off access to Twitter and cutting off access to Facebook. But what are we doing here? We are giving carte blanche for the government to cut off access to lawful websites. And while the bill claims that it's targeting so-called foreign websites, foreign is defined as one that is used by Americans. So it's really not limited to foreign websites. And I believe that if we were to pass a bill like this, the U.S. loses its moral authority to set an example for the world as a place of internet freedom. This is really American-style censorship. And for what? Even the proponents of the bill have admitted that the number of so-called rogue websites they're concerned about number in the tens or hundreds. And when uh, Frederick Hunsbury, the COO of Paramount Pictures, testified about six, seven months ago uh, in front of uh, the IP subcommittee in the House, he said that the number of rogue websites that concerned his company numbered 20. So that is, that, this bill is overkill. It is a blunderbuss way when there are more targeted ways of getting at the problem, I agree with both uh, representatives that the go after the money approach is the right approach, but this is just, this is just going to cause, as Ed said, collateral damage uh, to the Internet. So why do we want to you know, restructure the Internet and destabilize the Internet for 20 websites? It doesn't make any sense to me. Let me make one last sort of half point. The hearing tomorrow has six witnesses, five of whom are proponents of the bill, one of whom will oppose it. No public interest representation, no human right representation from human rights groups, 
no internet engineer who could talk about the effect on the DNS system and the DNS security, DNS sec, and how it would affect that. So this is really being railroaded without a full public debate. And I think that is, that is wrong, that's undemocratic, uh, and unfortunate.